Uh, my name is Aaron Kimball, uh, and I'm going to give you guys an industry perspective on Hadoop. So uh, welcome to the Hadoop track. Uh, it's an honor to be able to open it. Uh, I'd like to very briefly thank, uh, again, the hosts of this conference for putting together such a great uh, schedule and doing all this great logistical work, keeping it all running really well. So before I dive into the content here, I just want to take a brief pulse of the audience here. So can you guys just raise your hand if you've used Hadoop before? All right, most of you. Um, has everybody here heard of Hadoop before? Great. So in terms of not just Hadoop, but has anybody used one of the higher level projects uh, for processing, like Hive or Pig? Less of you. OK. What about uh, some of the related storage engines, like HBase or OK, Cassandra? Many fewer. All right. Good info. Thanks. All right, so of you who've downloaded Hadoop, who downloads Hadoop from Cloudera? All right, hopefully we'll try to change that a bit by the end of this talk. So you've by now seen a large number of Hadoop talks where uh, the guy up front tells you about how word count works. This is not that talk. Uh, we're going to talk about Hadoop as a platform and what the impact of that platform is on your organization and how that platform is moving forward. So the key thing that you need to know coming away from this talk is that Hadoop is the most scalable analytic data processing platform that's available today, and it's open source. This is a pretty dense sentence here, so I'm going to break this down uh, to highlight what I think are the key things I'm trying to get across here. First and foremost, Hadoop is scalability. There's an awful lot of things that we're seeing at this conference that can scale to very large numbers of machines, uh, store impressive volumes of data, but Hadoop has been demonstrated uh, in production on petabytes of information at a time. Uh, Yahoo is one of the largest operators of Hadoop clusters. They have several clusters going at a time in production, some of which are up to 4,000 machines working in concert, operating individual programs across many terabytes of information at a time. Scalability uh, has a bunch of concerns associated with it, though. It's not enough for me to tell you that the algorithm can be pushed out to a large number of machines. Uh, or that your data can be copied to a large number of machines. SCP in a for loop uh, would get you that. But one of the things that Hadoop does really well with its scalability is that it also ensures reliability and durability at the same time. So we can store petabytes of information across uh, tens of thousands of hard drives, across thousands of machines. But this storage system is also an active intelligent storage system. It's going to continually monitor all of these machines and detect failures when hard drives go bad, machines lose power, network hardware goes on the fritz, and reroute the system so that this information remains available for continuous processing. With this processing, we also get a powerful analytic platform. As we add more machines to our Hadoop cluster, not only do we get increased storage capacity, but we also get increased compute capacity. CPUs come on board every time we add uh, more data storage ability. And these CPUs can be used to perform very powerful analytic work. When we have very large volumes of data, we need to do something to make that data useful, to turn that data into knowledge. That's processing. Relational database systems allow us to do this processing in a number of ways very quickly for a very well-defined set of problems. MapReduce, the processing engine that runs on top of Hadoop, provides a much greater expressive power than any relational database system. Relational databases can do things like join different tables of great size, but you have to already define the relations that they're going to be joining across. With MapReduce, you can run arbitrary user code uh, on both sides of the join so that you can calculate new information out of what you've got stored. And in addition to this, of course, you can also still perform the same relational operations that you have been doing but now you can do it at a far greater scale than you could with existing platforms. Platform is another key word here. Hadoop is getting a lot of buzz. We see articles in the New York Times about Hadoop and Wired Magazine talking about MapReduce. And the word MapReduce itself is something of a buzzword. People like to have a MapReduce platform on top of their system. But Hadoop, the storage uh, layer, as well as the MapReduce processing engine, are really just the kernel of a larger distributed operating system, you could almost think of it. There's a thriving ecosystem around Hadoop 
of other projects that augment Hadoop uh, and augment one another. Throughout the rest of this talk, we'll take a look at a few of these uh, ecosystem components and what their ramifications are for you. And finally, this system is open. Open source, open data, and an open standard. The code itself is open sourced. Hadoop is a project of the Apache Software Foundation, so everything in there is Apache 2.0 licensed. You can download a copy uh, for free, inspect it all. Uh, but more important than that is that your data is also in an open format. Most of what Hadoop will operate on are just text-based uh, forms of data, delimited text files, JSON data, XML files, the rest. There are also binary data formats that Hadoop can work with natively. These formats offer you uh, increased performance, of course, but the tools that you have to operate on them are also open, so you're never locked in. There are tools available that will dump them straight back to text if that's what you uh, really prefer. So it's easy to get data into Hadoop. It's equally easy to take data out of Hadoop into whatever's the next system that makes the most sense uh, as a home for your information afterward. The standard uh, that Hadoop is becoming is also a really important aspect here. Implementing MapReduce as a programming model a one-to-one -one transformation followed by a sort, followed by a many-to-one reduction uh, is not in itself a hard problem. We could do this in 100 lines of Python. But doing this operation in a high-performance, scalable fashion suddenly becomes a lot trickier, especially when fault tolerance gets involved. Hadoop has a lot of man years of effort invested in it from developers across the world. And when organizations need a powerful MapReduce platform, they're turning to Hadoop not just for their own use, but also for what they provide to others. Very recently, IBM announced that they were going to have a new MapReduce-based uh, business intelligence platform available, Infosphere Big Insights. IBM, with its you know, tens of thousands of developers, could have easily begun a project to rival Hadoop. But rather than doing so, they concentrated on what is becoming the de facto standard and use Hadoop as their uh, core of their offering. Similarly, Amazon has built a lot of great infrastructure that they then sell to the world in the form of Amazon Web Services. If you need a uh, distributed key value store, Amazon has built two of them, Amazon S3 and SimpleDB. But when they realized that they should also offer an analytic batch processing system, they didn't build their own MapReduce engine running on top of EC2. They turned to Hadoop and grafted Hadoop on top of EC2. It's an API that's becoming familiar to a larger number of developers, and it's a kernel that's getting increasingly tuned by the day uh, to perform these workloads in a high-performance fashion. So, talked about Hadoop a lot, just to briefly introduce myself, since I haven't really done so. Uh, my name, once again, is Aaron Kimball, and I'm an engineer at Cloudera. Engineer is a bit of a constrained term. Cloudera being a startup, I've worn an awful lot of hats over the last year and a half that we've been in business. I do a lot of engineering coding. I also run training sessions, speak at fine events like this, perform customer support, uh, everything else under the sun. But more important than uh, the number of things that I do at Cloudera is what Cloudera employees can do together. And what that is is provide the industry standard Hadoop distribution, which is an enterprise-ready platform uh, for consuming and operating on your data. We'll talk a little bit more about what this means in a few more slides. I told you this talk is going to be about the Hadoop ecosystem so, and where it's going. But before we appreciate where Hadoop is going, we need to focus uh, a little bit of attention on where Hadoop has been. The seeds of Hadoop were planted around 2002. Uh, two developers, Doug Cutting and Mike Caffarella, were working on an offshoot of the Lucene indexing project called Nutch. Nutch was an open source search engine. Still is, in fact. And Nutch provided uh, a core using Lucene that will perform the indexing of documents, as well as a web-based front end so that you can actually serve uh, these results to users when they type in a search query. And the Nutch project was also an Apache Software Foundation project and was growing and growing. And around 2003, they started to hit the limits of what they could accomplish. This limit was about 200 million pages in the index. 200 million pages is an awful lot of pages, but not if you're trying to crawl the entire web. Fortunately, at this same time, 
Google released some academic papers describing the architecture of their large-scale processing and indexing framework. The two key papers that came out of this were a paper called GFS, the Google File System, which allows the Google to store terabytes and petabytes of information, and MapReduce, which allows them to process this information. The actual implementations of GFS and Google MapReduce are closed and proprietary to Google, but they shared the 20-page version of the design of each of these. This was a big aha moment for the Nutch developers, and they set to work in 2004 implementing this sort of framework on top of Nutch uh, in what started out as the Nutch distributed file system uh, and Nutch MapReduce, which later got carved off into their own sub-project, which was called Hadoop. So that was really born in 2004. <coughs> With this infrastructure in place, Nutch could get past this 200 million page barrier and push to several orders of magnitude larger uh, in what they could store. By 2006, the Hadoop project was starting to gain some serious momentum as a worthwhile project to do not just indexing for a particular search engine, but also as a more general purpose platform for large-scale processing. Yahoo realized the power of this platform and in 2006 hired Doug Cutting uh, to take the Hadoop project, bring it to Yahoo, and devote serious uh, engineering efforts to making this a scalable system. In 2006, a MapReduce cluster uh, running Hadoop could scale to 20 to 25 machines. We are now seeing systems on the order of 200 times that size and scale running uh, performantly in production. There were several other highlights along the way. By 2007, other organizations uh, could start to use Hadoop to perform data processing that they needed to do without themselves being serious engineering companies. Uh, the New York Times managed to uh, process four terabytes of their archives uh, using Hadoop to convert from a proprietary format into PDFs to make that archive available on the web to their users. The New York Times is not an organization known for having a large-scale uh, engineering department. So the fact that their engineers could take uh, this external system and graft it in was a major step forward. 2008 was a banner year for getting the momentum really rolling behind Hadoop. Yahoo uh, claimed a benchmark win with the fastest sort of a terabyte of data uh, at 300, or I'm sorry, three and a half minutes over 900 nodes. By 2008, we also saw other small organizations, web companies like Last.fm use Hadoop in production uh, without necessarily needing to be serious uh, engineers on Hadoop, but merely clients of Hadoop. Facebook also became a major client of Hadoop, just deploying Hadoop at the scale of hundreds of machines. And in 2008, they also uh, released their open source project called Hive. The impact here is that Hive is another project extending the Hadoop ecosystem. It's a framework in its own right built on top of the MapReduce framework. Cloudera was also founded in 2008, and we set to work uh, doing what we do. By 2009, we started to see performance of Hadoop increase a lot. Uh, Yahoo claimed a new benchmark record where they sorted a terabyte in about a minute, but could also sort a petabyte of data on almost 4,000 machines uh, at that time in a little over 16 hours. So this is the, the first sort of instance of being able to sort data at this scale. In 2009, Cloudera uh, also uh, welcomed Doug Cutting aboard so he can take his vision for Hadoop and help uh, make that Cloudera's. And we also started to see a lot more industry attention to Hadoop. Yahoo held the Hadoop Summit that June. We held the Hadoop World Conference in New York City that fall. We had hundreds of attendees just talking about Hadoop, half of whom who came had never actually worked with Hadoop before, but had merely heard about it and knew that it might be useful. And now this year, we're starting to see Hadoop become really useful in production as a stable platform for enterprises. The Cloudera's distribution for Hadoop uh, released a stable launch uh, in March, and will continue to provide stable, reliable platforms uh, on a regular basis coming forward. What this platform is made of is an evolving ecosystem. As I said, Hadoop has gotten a lot of major uh, buzz from, from large organizations, uh, and people know that MapReduce is useful. But one of the other exciting, useful things is that in 2008, Facebook released the Hive project, which allows you to take SQL uh, and run it over your data in an HDFS cluster. 
Java development skills no longer required. Yahoo released a similar project called Pig, which is a data flow language, which does many similar things uh, for their analysts, lowering the bar to entry uh, for large-scale data processing. We also started to see alternate storage frameworks moving forward. HBase, a key value, um, HBase, a column store database built on top of Hadoop, uh, borrowing the architecture of Google's Bigtable. Cassandra, a distributed key value store. We started to see other low-level infrastructure projects like Zookeeper, whose logo is on the left, uh, and the Avro serialization and RPC project uh, building in, which allows for cross-language compatibility uh, through RPC. We're also seeing libraries of MapReduce algorithms getting published that people can take and use in their own systems without necessarily uh, being domain experts, the Mahout project being one of the most important here. Mahout's a machine learning uh, project. You heard a little bit yesterday uh, from uh, Grant Ingersoll's uh, keynote about this. Mahout has a book out. They've had several releases. And so now, without needing a master's degree in machine learning, you can apply these advanced statistical models to your own information, getting started, uh, lowering the barrier to entry. What all these different projects have in common is that they focus on Hadoop as their internal platform. All of this represents a great degree of creativity in the open system. And this creativity is enabled by the fact that all of these aspects are open source. There's a lot of cutting edge work happening inside the kernel itself of Hadoop. Two major projects uh, which came forward this year are improvements to the file system's flexibility and security. The file system itself has gained uh, a new major feature called Appends. We can now modify existing data sets, which was uh, a major challenge uh, in the face of the consistency guarantees that HDFS has already promised to its clients. And we also see new scalability increases in the form of symlinks. We can now have one cluster make a reference to another HDFS cluster. Clients of the first cluster can seamlessly transition to accessing data from the second, but it looks like a single coherent file system topography to the client. We also see a lot of important work happening in security integration with Kerberos. So this enables organizations that have much stronger requirements around data privacy, uh, business practice isolation, get to use Hadoop in their data centers when before uh, their legal compliance would have prevented them from doing so. But we're also seeing a great degree of momentum at the edges of this ecosystem. Hive is gaining a great degree uh, of integration with other systems in the form of standards compliant JDBC and ODBC interfaces. Uh, HBase, the column store database that I told you about, is getting performance and reliability improvements daily. Uh, depending on how fast one of my exceptionally talented coworkers uh, types, it's at this point actually really hourly uh, how fast that's moving. We're also seeing other projects like Cassandra tie themselves more into MapReduce so that users can use both of these systems in conjunction with one another. But all of this creativity, it's like a, a swarm uh, of ants. They're an army, but it's an army that's in an organized in an ad hoc fashion. And so what we see is fits and starts, advances and slight retreats. Getting this append support to work in Hadoop, for example, uh, has been a project that's taken a number of years. I don't think any of us really appreciated the subtle complexity uh, of this distributed systems challenge uh, when we embarked on that journey. And so there were releases that contained appends, and then it got revoked. Now it's coming back again. Uh, we think that we've got it right this time. Individual releases of Hadoop have had a greater degree of stability or a lesser degree of stability. Uh, you know, it's kind of like um, the Star Trek movies. You only want the even-numbered ones. So we, we see a lot of, of different degrees uh, of, of quality coming out of different things. But that's just a, uh, an artifact of the velocity with which this project is moving. In addition to this velocity, we also see that all these different ecosystem components uh, are being organized as they are in a very decentralized fashion. So release schedules for one project rarely line up with the release schedules of another project. Building something that has dependencies on two of these different projects can be very frustrating uh, because you have to wait for the latest of your dependencies to make that next release, getting in the feature you need. And this developer-centric model is great for hackers. If you work from uh, Subversion yourself, then all you need to do, take the latest and greatest patches, uh, push them out, uh, and you're well on your way to building a really cool new cutting-edge system. But this isn't very business-friendly. 
organizations that have to guarantee service levels to multiple departments, organizations that need to plan for provisioning large-scale systems uh, in a data center where they have specific requirements on compliance, on power and money budgets, uh, on uh, the compatibility with this and the underlying OS uh, and the, all the systems that run above it. Uh, this is a very frustrating place to work. Where Cloudera comes in is providing our distribution for Hadoop, a reliable release for the consumers of several open source systems. The Apache hackers who are building the bleeding edge technology uh, are obviously going to continue to work on Subversion Trunk. However, if Hadoop is central to your mission as an enabler of ingesting information, then this isn't really where you want to be. You need a stable, tested core of things that work well together. Our distribution packages up a working suite of systems. So two key words here, packages and suite. Downloading uh, from, from the Subversion repository, building from the source there, and then deploying is not something that IT departments tend to like to do. They like to use industry standard tools like Yum uh, or apt-get. And we provide packages in these forms that allow them to integrate with their existing package management workflows. It's also a suite of systems. It's a distribution for Hadoop, not a distribution of Hadoop. Hadoop is obviously the kernel at the heart of this, but we also add other packages like Hive and Pig that enable people uh, to work with these systems. And this forms a predictable basis for further cross-project development needs. All of the packages that we provide in a distribution work together. You don't need to worry about which of the seven releases of Pig uh, or the five releases of Hive are compatible with a particular release of Hadoop. We, uh, we, we pick versions that work together and sand off the rough edges to make sure that you get a, a more seamless integrated experience. And it's enterprise ready. We have support available so that organizations can depend on this uh, without needing to commit their own engineering resources to putting out the fires. And finally, this isn't uh, some, some uh, proprietary offering. All of these packages are open source. We provide source uh, DEBs and SRPMs of everything that we ship so that you can inspect all of the exact bits that you're going to be running. It's all under the same Apache 2 license as the original projects themselves. It's also not a fork of these projects. It's not a branch of the code tree. It's behind the development trunk of each of these projects. So one of the frustrations of a very mature project like Hadoop that's been in development for six years is that while the development velocity is very great, the burdens of testing, packaging, uh, and providing releases is something that Apache is only capable of performing once every nine to 12 months. Uh, the last release, Hadoop 20, uh, came out last June. We're hoping to see version 21 come out in the next uh, upcoming weeks as well. So in order to get bug fixes to users, then there needs to be a higher velocity mechanism that provides this ability. So one of the other things that Cloudera's distribution guarantees is a very predictable release timeline. We produce a new distribution uh, wave uh, once every six months, and these distributions have guaranteed lifetimes of two years each so that your organization uh, can uh, build its own phased-in plan. What are the dependencies that my platform is going to depend on for the next year and be confident that these are going to continue to work over that timeline. Having a platform that ties many different projects together also allows us to build other exciting tools like Cloudera Desktop. Cloudera Desktop is a web-based user interface to the Hadoop system. We provide a number of applications within this framework. On this screen, you can see three different applications. Uh, on the le upper left, a file browser allowing you to browse HDFS using a user interface very similar to the one you'd see in OS X, Windows, or Linux. On the right, there's a cluster health summary showing monitoring dashboards of how all of your nodes are doing. At the bottom, you can see a job designer that allows users to schedule and run MapReduce jobs. But while these tools are themselves, we think, very handy, we also believe that this is an exciting component of a broader platform. Cloudera Desktop is building an SDK which will allow other organizations to build uh, applications on top of this system so that you can have applications running in the browser uh, so that analysts and others in your organization can use the power of MapReduce without needing to use a 
command line interface uh, and all of the developer-centric tools that we've already got. The Cloudera Desktop SDK will operate in two directions. It'll operate downward, allowing you to integrate into Hadoop, scheduling jobs more easily, uh, sending files to the HDFS cluster, retrieving data from HDFS. But it's also uh, an SDK that moves upward, providing a coherent look and feel and a set of integrated applications. In your application, you can list an HDFS path. You just can click on that path, and a file browser window like the one you see in the upper left will pop up. You don't have to implement your own file browser widgets. These applications are already provided. When your application performs an analysis, schedules a MapReduce job, that can show a job ID in a button. The user clicks that button. They get the job viewer that's showing the progress of the job, showing the logs, the diagnostic output of that job, where it is in the scheduling queue for the cluster at large, and so forth. So thank you for indulging the marketing pitch. Back to Hadoop itself. With Hadoop, you get several different options for how you perform your large-scale data processing. MapReduce is the most well-known tool that allows you to actually run code on a cluster across a huge number of machines. I think this is something that sets this apart from an awful lot of the other still exciting technologies that we're seeing at this conference, like MongoDB, CouchDB, uh, and the several other key value stores that are available, uh, other NoSQL systems. Uh, a lot of these systems are focused on storing and perhaps indexing this data. But MapReduce allows you to write any Java program you want and get that custom data transformation across uh, to all of your bits. Of course, writing in Java is pretty heavyweight. When your boss comes to you, tells you that he's got this new Hadoop cluster, which can enable really great insight, and so he needs this report uh, by yesterday, you don't necessarily have the time to uh, debug and deploy a Java application. You're going to hack together something with Perl and regular expressions, uh, Python, et cetera. And so streaming is a simple API for the quick and dirty applications that you need running 10 minutes ago. Streaming uses standard input, standard output. You can run scripts. You can use awk with, scream, with streaming uh, if you want uh, and run it all just from a single command line. And so how cool is it? You can type something on your command line and suddenly see a progress bar that's indicating how that simple one-liner is now being deployed on 1,000 different machines. As I said, the Java MapReduce API is very feature-rich. It's had dozens of man years of engineering effort invested in it by a large number of organizations. But in a way, uh, all of this flexibility is also really daunting. It's uh, got a huge number of knobs, levers, dials, switches. And so it's almost like the assembly language uh, for a new uh, distributed computer architecture. And on top of this assembly language, we're starting to see higher level languages develop as well. Yahoo has a language called Pig, which is a custom data flow language that they've developed that their analysts use uh, to launch MapReduce applications. Pig makes it easy to perform certain uh, relational operations. It also ties into a standard library repository that, that Yahoo uses internally so that their engineers can drop Java code in and their analysts can run these user-defined functions or uh, engineer-defined functions as they are uh, on their information. Hive is a similar system that was predominantly developed at Facebook, but both of these are open source, both of these are Apache projects and being contributed to by the community at large. Hive provides SQL-like familiarity with the expressiveness of Java. Hive is fantastic for operating on information which is already relational or mostly relational. Maybe you have several relational fields and then embedded JSON blobs in these fields. Hive provides you with the ability to quickly join both across these existing uh, traditional columns as well as quickly perform inspection of these uh, arbitrarily sized columns uh, with a more ad hoc schema. Hive also allows you to run streaming scripts right within a SQL query or to embed UDFs and user-defined aggregates which were written in Java uh, across all of this data. So again, when you want to do a join, a group by, a filter, th the quick relational operations that we expect to uh, be written for us, they are there, one command, they're done. When you need to go further, you can add the Java in, but still tie it into this existing framework that provides you with a coherent view of all of your data sets together. But these processing systems are nothing without the ability to scalably store and then read back all of the information that you want to work with. HDFS, the Hadoop Distributed File System, 
is the best of breed storage platform for Hadoop. It's got the most development effort, and so it's the most mature uh, offering available. And this will store virtually limitless data. Today, we can get four to 5,000 machines running HDFS with 10 one terabyte disks per machine. We can store several petabytes of information in a cluster. By the time we have organizations that need to store 100 petabytes, I imagine that the machines will be bigger, and by then, Hadoop will also be uh, scalable enough to handle that many machines with ease as well. So thousands of nodes can be reached by the system, and thousands of nodes can be effectively monitored by the system. Data is replicated across machines, across racks, to ensure durability to a number of common failure scenarios, and there's a monitoring infrastructure built into HDFS that detects these failure scenarios and ensures that these invariants, like the number of replicas that must be available, are continually maintained uh, over the lifetime of your data. There are also other exciting projects that offer other means of storing your information. HBase is a column store database based on Bigtable, uh, which provides more interactive access to information. It provides updates to narrow ranges of information as well, uh, built on top of HDFS. Cassandra is another take on a similar system, providing the distributed key value store architecture while still having the columnar access model uh, demonstrated by HBase. <coughs> And I think that where this large-scale data in ecosystem is getting really interesting is not just taking the lens at Hadoop on top of itself, or at Hadoop and Hive, or Hadoop and HBase. I think the really exciting momentum coming forward is when the true integration across this ecosystem happens, and it starts to uh, form into an even more coherent whole. Two particular examples of this sort of ecosystem integration that I want to highlight have to do with Hive and HBase and Cassandra and MapReduce. So Hive has a definition of a table, and it can apply a schema uh, ad hoc to the data sets that you are loading in. And you traditionally had to use HDFS to load in these data sets doing a bulk loaded model. But now we can also apply Hive's analytic uh, front end and its schema definition capabilities to tables which are physically stored in the HBase layer and are uh, also interacted with through HBase's front end. Similarly, we're seeing Cassandra provide a MapReduce IO layer to their information. So with Cassandra, uh, you can inject information uh, using the key value architecture that it already provides. But in addition to that, you can then use MapReduce programs to perform more advanced analytics over all this information uh, streaming it all straight in and getting large-scale results back out. This allows the Cassandra project to focus on its core, what it does best, building their distributed key value architecture, rather than have to reinvent the MapReduce wheel on top of their framework. But integration needs to move further than just the Apache ecosystem. What is going to be the truly revolutionary step in bringing Hadoop to the next level of audience is compatibility with all of the other entrenched tools that they have available. Existing RDBMS platforms, tr traditional OLTP databases like Oracle and MySQL, as well as large-scale uh, data warehousing platforms, OLAP systems as well, and business intelligence tools like Crystal Reports. We're starting to see a couple projects take place in this area. Scoop is a project that I work on that allows Hadoop to import and export tables between HDFS and a relational system. Hive is also getting standards compliant interfaces in the form of ODBC. Scoop allows you to unlock your database and push it into Hadoop. You can take a table, move it from MySQL to Hadoop, where you can then run a MapReduce program with your user defined more powerful queries there. You can then also use Hive to run queries over the same data, boil it down into a new aggregate data set, and then push those results back to MySQL, uh, where it can be presented to your end users. As a shameless pitch, if you're curious more about this topic, I'll be speaking at length about it, Scoop, uh, at 350 in this room. So hope to see a lot of you back there then. We've seen statistics uh, and, and pie charts that look like this throughout uh, the last couple of days, so I don't need to dwell on them too hard. But as everybody in here knows, everybody who's deployed MongoDB, React, CouchDB, Voldemort, 
uh, structured, rigidly structured columnar data is only uh, one piece of the story. The ad hoc data is a much larger data set. And we're going to start to see a huge volume of that ad hoc data get collected now that we have tools like HDFS that allow scalable ingestion and storage of this large volume of information. And instead of just thinking about Hadoop as an ad hoc or a complex data processing system, we should think of Hadoop as an integrated single source for all components of information. It's great to think about Hadoop as an ability to uh, perform a complex query over the web logs uh, or documents that you need to index that you've collected through a web crawl. But how much more powerful are these analyses when performed in concert with the structured data you've already captured? Web logs can give you great intelligence into uh, the efficacy of ad campaigns running on a web property. How much more effective are these sorts of analyses when done in conjunction with the existing user database that you've already collected? Now you can understand the demographic information of the particular visitors to your website and watch their flow uh, through your exact application. This single data system can encompass a broad universe of data types uh, and perform coherent results out of all of these. Hive is a great tool that allows you to use Java functions and existing relational operators on these combined data sets. Second shameless pitch I'll give, if you're really curious about seeing how Hive can be a powerful part of your platform, I really urge you to go see my colleague Sarah Spronel's talk, uh, which will be occurring just after mine in the other room at 445. I told you that this would be an industry perspective on Hadoop, so it's important for me to put in at least one slide about dollars and cents. And in the context of your data, what the key figure of merit that you need to think about is, is what's the return on byte? It costs money to store bytes in a form you can access them. It costs money to run analyses. So what you need to ask yourself is, is the value of the knowledge you are gaining from some set of bytes greater than the cost of storing and processing those bytes? If the answer is no, then that information sinks down to the ocean of data that we've got, which in practical terms, means we consign it to tape. Tape, as we know, uh, is a dead medium. You only ever use tape for disaster recovery. Nobody ever thinks, we have a large-scale processing question that can give us information about the company. Let's load six years of tape archives back into the system and see what it gives us. But what Hadoop does is it works on both sides of that fraction, value to extract from data and the cost of storing the bytes. Hadoop runs on commodity architectures, PCs from HP, Dell, other commodity uh, components, running Linux and other commodity systems. Uh, so the cost of storing information uh, are getting lowered, and so that will raise the iceberg above the waterline. It's also much easier to write analyses that can work on all of this large-scale data at the same time. Using Java MapReduce, using Hive, using streaming, you can write analyses in only a couple of hours. You don't have to build a distributed framework yourself to run this processing. So the engineering cost of asking questions also gets lowered. You can ask more questions. You can ask iteratively refined questions to really dig into your data and get much truer insight. Again, raising the iceberg uh, and giving you a higher return on your bytes. We're starting to see this bear out in practice for a large number of organizations across several industries. At Hadoop World last fall, we were really excited at the number of application talks that we uh, received from a number of different audiences. We saw financial institutions like J.P. Morgan Chase and Visa uh, present how they're using Hadoop to analyze financial information. We saw telecoms like China Mobile, uh, consulting organizations like Booz Allen Hamilton talking about using Hadoop in biotech fields. We also saw a great deal of use in traditional high-tech industries, the web properties like eHarmony, Yahoo, and Facebook, again, using the power of Hadoop to advance their industry. But we're seeing Hadoop used where it's not necessarily a core part of their uh, internal efforts. It's a core part of the data and the knowledge they need to get out of it. If you're curious about these various applications, we taped all the talks from Hadoop World. All of the slides and the videos are available on our website, cladera.com slash hadoop-world-nyc. So 
let's put this together. We saw that Hadoop itself is growing and changing. The kernel of Hadoop MapReduce and HDFS are being advanced, improvements in security, improvements in file system flexibility. But more importantly, there's an ecosystem of other projects growing and changing and gelling around this kernel. And it's really starting to achieve a critical mass uh, of attention and of momentum that can move forward. So we're looking forward to seeing you all join in uh, and start using Hadoop uh, in your own organizations as well. Thank you for your time. Do we have time for questions? Uh, yeah, let's say five minutes for questions. Are there any questions? Um, well, hello. I read that um, when you're using Hadoop, you have one single node um, who is kind of a main server node. So um, this is kind of a single point of failure. Or is there a, um, a way per, by design to make it redundant or In reliable? theory, this is a problem. In practice, it's not. Uh, there's thousands of nodes in your cluster. When you just roll the dice, the odds that some node are going to die are pretty high. The odds that the king node in the corner uh, not so much, especially if you devote some extra attention to the hardware there. Give that one redundant power supplies, uh, fault tolerant, uh, redundant hard disks, etc. Uh, organizations like Yahoo, who run many thousands of nodes, say that they've had a number of downtime incidents over the last several years, most of which involved configuration changes, bugs in their own software, uh, power loss across the data center itself. There were only a very slight handful of downtime actually associated uh, with that particular failure case. So. Uh, it has turned out not to be a terribly major problem, which is why you don't really see a lot of attention devoted to solving it. Okay. Uh, I've seen one more question over there. Right. It's been recorded. Please wait for the mic. Do you or are you planning to support um, Hadoop on demand? Hadoop on demand. Uh, that's the Hadoop on top of PBX system. Uh, we don't actually see terribly much use of uh, Hadoop on demand. Um, it's also a project that has not received a terribly great amount of development velocity uh, over the last year or so. So I don't necessarily think that it's going to be um, a major focus of our attention. Um, Hadoop on demand has other uh, issues associated with it, principally in the form of data locality. Uh, the PBX scheduler is unaware of where Hadoop has placed your data blocks. So it winds up being a much less efficient way to do large scale processing. Uh, you really want dedicated Hadoop clusters. Part of the initial need for Hadoop on demand is the ability to schedule multiple organizations across the same cluster. But inside Hadoop, we're starting to see systems like the FAIR scheduler, which allow different business units inside the same company share a cluster in a more resource appropriate way as well. Okay, two more questions. Oh, no. Ah, yeah. Oh, there. Hi. Um, the Cloudio guys have a lot of Hadoop committers. Um, and there's a lot of Cloudio releases. But Apache releases don't really happen as frequently, which is uh, slightly concerning. Is, there, is that likely to be addressed? I mean, it's being addressed right now. Um, there has been discussions on uh, the Hadoop mailing list. So uh, if you subscribe to Hadoop-general at, at uh, Hadoop.Apache, uh, there's a lot of talk about how to make uh, developments ensure that releases from Apache come out regularly. Uh, Cladera uh, has uh, Tom White, the author of the Hadoop book, uh, on staff. And one of his current projects actually is championing the Apache 0.21 release. So we are committed to getting that out and ensuring that releases continue to happen as well. Are there more questions? I believe there's a couple on this side. Oh boy, now I'm in for it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Steve Lochran. I think I'm the only Hadoop committer in the room right now. Is that right? Or do you have commit rights? Not yet. OK. Um, one point is, as Tim said, there is a new release of Hadoop coming. Anyone who has a large cluster to spare should really come and participate right now to help test it in more systems. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I think there was a question in the front. Hello. Yeah, you said that there are a lot of scientists that are using Hadoop without engineering knowledge. 
And do you expect their uh, binding to other programming languages in the future, like Python or uh, MATLAB or R or so? As I said, uh, Python is already inherently supported through the streaming interface. Uh, a system like R would be more complicated. R's internal architecture materializes entire data sets in memory uh, and operates on the whole data set together. So I think that you'd need to ask the R team about re-architecting their system to allow for partition data to see that really uh, work well with Hadoop at large scale. Mm. Uh, but that's certainly an area that I would love to see uh, more development in, but I think that's going to require the domain experts for those languages and tools to step forward themselves. Did you hear of um, MATLAB, for example, commercial uh, support? Uh, interestingly, amongst the clients that we've got, I have yet to hear MATLAB uh, get mentioned. Um, so I don't really know what the state of MATLAB development really is. Thank you. Okay, um, thanks, Aaron. And